Welcome to part two of The Whole Brain Child. I'll be discussing three more strategies to help nurture your child's developing mind. As a parent, you often know that you can't be with your kids every second of the day. But how can you teach them to do the right thing and control themselves even when you are not around? One of the most important skills we can teach our kids is to make good decisions in high emotion situations. We want them to pause before acting, to consider consequences, to think about the feelings of others, to make ethical and moral judgments. Sometimes they come through with the kind of behavior that makes us proud, and sometimes they don't. In the previous part of the whole brain child, we were just talking about integrating the left and the right brain. This time, let's talk about integrating the upstairs and the downstairs brain. Imagine that your brain is a house with both a downstairs and an upstairs. The downstairs brain includes the brain stem and the limbic region, which are located in the lower parts of the brain, from the top of your neck to the, about the bridge of your nose. Scientists talk about these lower areas as being more primitive because they are responsible for basic human functions, like breathing and blinking, for innate reactions and impulses like fight or flight, and for strong emotions like anger and fear. Your basic necessities get taken care of downstairs. Your upstairs brain is completely different. It's made up of the cerebral cortex, cortex and its various parts, particularly the ones directly behind your forehead, including, that, including what's called the middle prefrontal cortex. Unlike your more basic downstairs brain, the upstairs brain is more evolved and can give you a fuller perspective on your words. This is where more intricate mental processes take place, like thinking, imagining, and planning. Whereas the downstairs brain is primitive, the upstairs brain is highly sophisticated, controlling some of your most important, higher order and analytical thinking. Because of its sophistication and complexity, it is responsible for producing many of the characteristics we hope to see in our kids. Sound decision making and planning, control over emotions and body, self-understanding, empathy and morality. As parents and teachers, we would like to reinforce the metaphorical stairway that connects the child's upper and lower brain so that the two can work as a team. When a fully functioning staircase is in place, the upper and lower parts of the brain are vertically integrated. What we do need to remember is that even though the downstairs brain is fully developed at birth, the upstairs brain is constantly a work in progress. It is still being developed. So things like sound decision making, control, self-understanding, empathy and morality are things that they still need to learn. And of course, this means kids are prone to getting trapped downstairs. Here you can say, my amygdala made me do it. The amygdala's job is to quickly process and express emotions, especially anger and fear. This little mass of grey matter is the watchdog of the brain, remaining always alert for times we might be threatened. When it does sense danger, it can completely take over or hijack the upstairs brain. That's what allows us to act before we think. And that is also what we call flipping our lid. And it's how the amygdala can get us into trouble. It takes over and relieves the upstairs brain from its duty, duties. When we're not truly in danger, we want to think before acting instead of the other way around. When a three-year-old at school erupts in anger because they want this toy and they want it right now, but someone else is playing with it, his downstairs brain, including the brainstem and amygdala, has sprung into action and latched the so-called baby gate on the staircase. This primitive part of his brain has received an intense surge of energy, leaving him literally unable to act calmly and reasonably. Massive brain resources have rushed to his downstairs brain, leaving little power to his upstairs brain. As a result, no matter how many times you tell him that, you, that they, we can find another toy or that he just needs to take his turn, he's probably not going to listen to reason at this moment. He's much more likely to throw something or yell at anyone nearby. New knowledge about the brain has taught us that there are two different types of tantrums. You get an upstairs tantrum and a downstairs tantrum. An upstairs tantrum is when a child is actually capable and decides to throw a tantrum. So this tantrum needs clear boundaries. A downstairs tantrum is when a child's brain gets completely hijacked by the downstairs and can no longer control the body or emotions or high order thinking and cannot think of problem solving or considering, considering others' feelings. When your child is in the middle of a full-on downstairs tantrum, there's only one thing you can do. You have to connect and redirect. This is a technique that I talked about in part one. The first thing you need to do is to connect with the child and help him calm himself down. This can often be accomplished through loving touch or a soothing tone of voice. Or if he has gone so far that he's in danger of hurting himself or someone else or destroying property, 
You may have to hold, hold him close and calmly talk him down as you remove him from the scene. Once the child is calmed down and the upstairs brain re-enters the picture, you can begin to respond to the issue using logic and reason. Once he is in a more receptive place, you can also talk about appropriate and inappropriate behavior and about possibly all the possible consequences. And your child is more likely to internalize the lessons because you're teaching it with his brain when his brain is more receptive to learning. Whole brain strategy number three, engage, don't enrage. In high stress situations, engage your child's upstairs brain rather than triggering the downstairs brain. Don't immediately play with because I said so or something. Instead, ask questions, request alternatives, even negotiate. Maybe you can say convince me or come up with a solution that works for both of us. We then give the kids a chance to practice problem solving and decision making. We help them consider appropriate behaviors and consequences and we help them think about what another person feels and wants. All because we found a way to engage the upstairs instead of enraging the downstairs. Whole brain strategy number four. Use it or lose it. The upstairs brain is like a muscle. When it gets used, it develops, gets stronger and performs better. And when it gets ignored, it doesn't develop optimally, losing some of its power and ability to function. This is where your decision making, controlling emotions and body, self-understanding, empathy and morality comes in. You want to be able to exercise these strategies with them so that they can learn in hypothetical situations and real situations to really use these. So instead of just rescuing the child all the time or just giving the answer, give them an opportunity to exercise the upstairs brain, making their own decisions, maybe putting them in someone else's shoes and let them learn to do it themselves. And finally, strategy number five, move it or lose it. Moving the body to avoid losing the mind. Research has shown that body bodily movement direct, directly affects brain chemistry. So when one of your children has lost touch with his upstairs brain, a powerful way to help him regain balance is to have him move his body. So when a child has lost touch with his upstairs brain, help him regain balance by having him move his body. Three more strategies done. Look out for part three where we'll be discussing two more. Thank you for watching.